Hello everyone, I am Dr. Manokta Masga. This is the first part of my video series on physical examination and they start to the topic. Every physical examination starts with general appearance. But before proceeding to the physical examination, make sure the patient is comfortable and the environment is adjusted. On general appearance, assess level of consciousness. Is the patient awake, alert and responsive to you? If not, specify the level of consciousness, whether the patient is lethargic, out in register press and comatose. Observe sign of distress, cardiac or respiratory distress. Observe the presence of liver breathing, is of accessory muscle, cyanosis, wheezing, strider and so on. The presence of pain and bleeding. If the patient has no any sign of distress and is not emaciated, you can say the patient is well looking. If the patient has sign of distress, you should mention he is acutely sick looking. If the patient is emaciated and malnourished, you should mention is chronically sick looking. Posture and gait. Does the patient assume sitting or supine position? That any presence of side preference and so on. Does there is dressing, grooming and personalizing of the patient. After general appearance, we should take vital sign of the patient. The first one is blood pressure. Blood pressure is measured either with automated or manually by spumanometer. Blood pressure is best measured in the seated position with the arm at the level of the head. Blood can be measured in supine or standing position. When you inflate the cuff above the systolic blood pressure, it completely compresses the brachial artery and no blood flow and no pulse. When you start deflating, it reaches a point where the systolic blood pressure exits the cuff pressure. And at this time, blood starts to flow and creates the first cortical sound, which is equivalent to the systolic blood pressure. When you keep on deflating, it reaches the level where the diastolic blood pressure exceeds the cup pressure. At this time, no compression and no sound. So this point where the cut of sound is disappeared equivalent to the diastolic blood pressure. Weak or inaudible cut of sounds. This occurred in four situations. The first one is due to technical problems. To avoid the technical problems, first localize the brachial artery, which is just medial to the bicep standard. After localizing it, put the stethoscope gently on the brachial artery. The second one is due to lack of experience. In the beginning, during your medical journey, it happens. So don't worry because no one learns from his mother soon. But keep on practicing and make yourself better. The third one is because of anus engorgement due to repeated inflations. To enhance the cold cough sound, raise the patient's hand before and while inflating the cup. The fourth one is due to shock. If the patient has feeble pulse and history of fluid loss or poverty, it is definitely shock. So don't worry on the cold cough sound, just proceed to resuscitation. When we measure blood pressure, the cuff size should be appropriate for each patient because an appropriately small cuff for adults overestimates the blood pressure and large cuff underestimates the blood pressure. So, length of inflatable bladder should be about 80% of the apparent circumference and width of the inflatable bladder of the cuff should be about 40% of the apparent circumference. How to measure blood pressure? First, the patient should have an empty bladder and rest comfortably and quietly for 5 minutes before the measurement. Second, avoid exercise, caffeinated drinks such as tea, coffee, smoking and arrhythmic drugs in the last 30 minutes of measurement. Back and arm should be supported, legs should be uncrossed and feet supported, no talking during and between measurements and the arm should be naked and the calf should be at the level of the heart. Blood pressure can be measured at office by healthcare providers or at home by the patient himself or herself. According to office blood pressure measurements, normal blood pressure is a systolic blood pressure of less than 130 mm of mercury and a diastolic blood pressure of less than 85 mm of mercury. Elevated blood pressure or prehypertension, a systolic blood pressure of 130 to 139 mm of mercury and or a diastolic blood pressure of 85 to 89 mm of mercury. Stage 1 hypertension, a systolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 114 mm of mercury and or diastolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 90 mm of mercury. Stage 2 hypertension, 
systolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 160 millimeter of mercury and or a diastolic blood pressure of 100 millimeter of mercury patients with systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure into categories should be grouped under the higher blood pressure category this classification is taken from the 2021 Ethiopian National Non-Community Disease Management Protocol. But if you use the 2017 High Blood Pressure Clinical Practice Guideline from American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, the cutoff values are different. Normal blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 mm of mercury, and a diastolic blood pressure of less than 18 mm of mercury. Elevated blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, 120 to 129 mm of mercury, and diastolic blood pressure, less than 18 mm of mercury. Stage 1 hypertension, systolic blood pressure, 130 to 139 mm of mercury, and or diastolic blood pressure, 80 to 89 mm of mercury. Stage 2 hypertension, systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 mm of mercury and or diastolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 90 mm of mercury as long as we are learning and working in Ethiopia we should follow our protocol hopefully when we create a good community awareness and facility this cut of values will be reduced to prevent premature death due to cardiovascular complications stroke and so on Pulse pressure is a difference between the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Pulse pressure is higher in case of hyperdynamic state, patients with arteriogenous fistula, aortic regurgitation, pregnancy, and so on. Whereas pulse pressure is lower in hypovolemic state, patients with shock or with heart failure. Blood pressure should be taken in both arms at least once because Pressure difference of more than 10 mm of mercury suggests arterial compression or obstruction on the side with the lower pressure. The lower limb pressure is usually higher than the upper by about 10 mm of mercury. Supine so and standing blood pressure measurements provide an assessment of paroceptor function and diagnose orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension is a 4 inch systolic pressure greater than 20 mm of mercury or in diastolic pressure greater than 10 mm of mercury in response to assumption of the upright posture from a supine position within 3 minutes. Orthostatic hypotension is a common cause of postural lightheadedness and syncope. The other one is pulse rate. The arterial pulses should be palpated for evaluation of rates, rhythm, character, and symmetry. Rate and rhythm are assessed by palpating the radial pulse. Normal pulse rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. If it is greater than 100 beats per minute, it is tachycardia. There are many causes for tachycardia, such as fever, hyperthyroidism, strenuous exercise, drugs, and arrhythmias. If it is less than 60 beats per minute, it is bradycardia. And there are many causes for bradycardia, such as drugs, hypothyroidism, increased intracranial pressures, conduction earth blocks, and so on. The normal sinus rhythm is regular. When the rhythm is irregular, it is further classified into irregularly irregular and irregularly irregular. Irregularly irregular rhythm is an irregular rhythm, but it has some pattern. Whereas irregularly irregular rhythm is completely irregular and has no any pattern. An irregular rhythm usually indicates atrial fibrillation. In patients with atrial fibrillation, the rate should be measured by auscultation at the cardiac apex because some beats that follow a very short diastolic interval may not have sufficient pressure to be palpable at the radial artery. So it creates pulse deficit and underestimates the heart rate when it is measured on the peripheral. So to avoid this, in atrial fibrillation, pulse rate should be measured peripherally as well as from the cardiac apex. Pulse deficit is the difference between apical heartbeat and peripheral pulse rate. Pulse character. Pulse character is defined by the volume and waveform of the pulse. 
it should be validated as the carotid artery that is closest to the heart and least subject to damp. Pulse volume provides a crude indication of stroke volume. The waveform of the pulse is characterized by the rate of rise of the carotid artery stroke. Let us see this picture. The y-axis represents the amplitude of the pulse in the meter of mercury and the x-axis represents the time in the seconds. The blue line, which represents aortic regurgitation, has a rapidly rising carotid pulse and collapses early. In aortic regurgitation, the left ventricle receives blood from the pulmonary venous return during diastole and from the aorta during the previous diastole. Due to that, it has high in diastolic volume and high stroke volume. This stroke volume creates a rapidly rising carotid pulse. And again, because of the aortic insufficiency, it collapses early. When we see the yellow line, which represents the aortic stenosis, it creates a slow rising carotid pulse. In aortic stenosis, because of the obstruction restricts the rate of ejection of blood from the left ventricle, it creates a slow rising carotid pulse. There are different types of pulse character. The first one is pulses alternance or alternating pulse. It is the presence of p 2 bit variability of pulse amplitude and it is found in heart failure. Water hammer pulse, it has a sharp rise and rapid follow of carotid pulse which is found in patients with aortic regurgitation. Pulses parvus eternus it is the presence of weak and delayed pulse, which is found in patients with aortic stenosis. Pulses bisferens or bifid pulse. It is the presence of two systolic peaks, which is found in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Pulses paradoxus. It is a fall in systolic pressure greater than 10 mm of mercury with inspiration. It is a misnomer because it is pressure, not pulse. The other, it is an exaggeration of the normal physiologic decline in systolic pressure during inspiration. During inspiration, intrathoracic pressure decreases. This results an increase in venous return and right ventricle in diastolic body. Because of ventricular interdependence, this affects the left ventricle compliance and function. And finally, results in a decline in systolic blood pressure. Exaggeration of this decline occurs in patients with pericardial effusion, pericardial tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, and severe obstructive lung disease. The other is per symmetry. Symmetry of the carotid, brachial, radial, femoral, popliteal, and pedal pulses should be confirmed. A reduced or absent pulse indicates an obstruction more proximally in the artery. artery. Radiofemoral delay is a symmetrical reduction and delay of the femoral pulses compared with the radial pulses, and it is a sign of coarctation of the aorta. Coarctation of the aorta should be suspected in younger patients with hypertension. The other component is respiratory rate. Observe the chest versus rate of respiration, rhythm of respiration, and symmetry of chest expansion. The normal rate of respiration in a relaxed adult is about 0 to 20 breaths per minute. If it is greater than 20 breaths per minute, it is tachypnea. If it is less than 0 breaths per minute, it is bradypnea. Kinestoke spreading, it is an alternating period of cessation of respiration and hyperventilation, which is found in patients with severe left ventricular failure. Cosmat breathing, it is a rapid and deep breathing, which is found in patients with metabolic acidosis, forced expiration. It is a prolonged expiratory phase with visible use of accessory muscles of the neck and intercostals, which is found in patients with obstructive lung diseases. Forced inspiration occurs when the lung has become mechanically rigid or in blockage of the large airways. The final component is temperature. Body temperature may be recorded in the mouse, axilla, ear, or recta. Rectal temperature is generally 0.4 to 0.5 degrees Celsius higher than oral temperature, and again oral temperature is 0.5 degrees Celsius higher than axillary temperature.
body temperature is regulated by the thermoregulator center in the hypothalamus between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius by balancing heat production from the liver and skeletal muscles and heat dissipation by the skin and by the lungs. There is a diurnal and seasonal variation in temperature. Lowest in the early morning hours and highest in the late afternoon. The normal diurnal variation is about 0.5 degrees Celsius. In women, ovulation is associated with a 0.5 degrees Celsius rise in temperature. Fever or pyrexia refers to an elevated body temperature. When core body temperature greater than 37.7 degrees Celsius in the afternoon or greater than 37.2 degrees Celsius in the morning. Hyperpyrexia refers to extreme elevation in temperature above 41.5 degrees Celsius, which occurs in patients with severe infections and intracranial hemorrhage. One thing you should know is the difference between fever and hyperthermia. Fever is an elevated body temperature in conjunction with increased hypothalamic temperature set point, whereas hyperthermia is an elevated body temperature in the absence of increased hypothalamic temperature set point. Therefore, hyperthermia is occurred when the body is unable to control excessive heat production or excessive heat exposure. Hypothermia refers to an abnormally low temperature when core body temperature below 35 degrees Celsius. Causes of fever include infection, trauma, malignancy, blood disorders or hematologic malignancies, drug re reactions, and immune disorders. The main cause of hypothermia is exposure to cold. Other predisposing causes include reduced movement as in paralysis and interference with vasoconstriction as from sepsis or excess alcohol, starvation, hypothyroidism, hypoglycemia, and being elderly people or newborns. Temperature plus dissociation or related bradycardia. It is a rise in temperature not matched by equivalent rise in heart rate. For every 1 degree Celsius rise in temperature, there is 10 bits per minute rise in heart rate. If this is not occurred, we call it temperature plus dissociation or related bradycardia, which is found in typhoid fever, brucellosis, and so fever of unknown origin. It is fever of 38.3 degree Celsius or more that lasts at least three weeks without a known etiology despite intensive variation in diagnostic testing. To declare fever of unknown origin, the patient should be immunocompromised and certain investigations should be done, such as CBC with differential, ASA, CRP, organ function test, urine analysis, blood culture, urine culture, antinuclear antibody, rheumatoid factor, abdominal ultrasound, chest X-ray, tuberculosis skin test, and so fever patterns. There are different fever patterns. The first one, continuous or persistent fever, when there is little variability from day to day febrile attacks. Intermittent fever, when there is a complete resolution between episodes. Remittent fever, when it subsides every day but still not completely resolved. Relapsing fever, stress of febrile attacks is lasting several days and all separated by febrile intervals. This is all about vital signs, and if you have any questions and suggestions, please write in the comment section. Thank you.